The ESP32 looks like the perfect chip. I mean, you get Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, dual core processing, lots of memory and peripherals, and best of all, it's dirt cheap. It's also literally everywhere from DIY maker projects to full scale commercial products. So it's easy to assume that popularity and features like these will make development easier. But that's exactly where so many developers go wrong. Because while the ESP32 can simplify certain things, it also introduces hidden design pitfalls that can quietly kill your product, especially if you don't know what to watch for. So in this video, we're gonna break down nine of the most common ESP32 design mistakes that can sabotage sabotage your product and we're going to show you how to avoid every single one of them. Mistake number one, choosing the wrong ESP32 variant. So Espressive has released a whole zoo of ESP32 variants. You've got the original ESP32, then there's the S2, the S3, the C3, the C6, the H2, and the new P4. Each one has different CPU cores, wireless support, power characteristics, memory sizes, and available peripherals. Choosing the wrong one can lead to wasted power, missing features, or even a complete board redesign. Some developers default to the most powerful option, thinking more is better, but in reality, that mindset just unnecessarily drives up your product's cost and ends up wasting power and generating unnecessary heat. Others go for the cheapest option only to discover too late that it doesn't support Bluetooth or it lacks enough GPIO pins or it can't support their specific peripherals. A better approach is to start by mapping out your product's actual needs. Do you need Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or both? How many pins do you need? How much RAM and flash memory do you need? What's your power budget? What peripherals do you require? Then choose the variant that meets those needs with some room to grow, but without going overboard. And always check the lifecycle status and forecast availability as well. The P4 variant, for example, offers a major leap in performance and peripherals, but availability is limited. It's exciting technology, but unless you're building in large volume with a locked in supply chain, it may introduce more risk than reward. Check the description below to grab your free design mistakes checklist bundle. You'll get this checklist right here with all of the ESP32 design mistakes that I discuss in this video. Plus you'll get all of my other design review checklists to help you avoid costly mistakes on your design. Links in the description below, or you can just scan this QR code right here. Mistake number two, not optimizing power consumption. The ESP32 is capable of ultra low power operation, but most designs don't take advantage of it correctly. I've seen products that should have lasted weeks on a single battery charge die in just a few days, all because the developer didn't turn off unused features or implement proper sleep strategy. One common issue is leaving Wi-Fi or Bluetooth enabled when the product isn't even communicating. That alone can drain a battery really quickly. Another is failing to use deep sleep between tasks. And sometimes sensor readouts are running full time when they only need to sample every few seconds or every even few minutes. Power optimization has to start early. That means defining your expected duty cycle, selecting low power components, and writing firmware that puts the ESP32 into deep sleep whenever possible. You also need to think about wake up sources, latency, and how to manage communication in burst rather than keeping everything on all the time. If you're using a dual core variant, it may be possible in some environments, like if using the ESP IDF, that you can idle or even disable the second core to save power. For simpler products, a single core chip like the ESP32 C3 or C6 might be a better fit. Fewer cores mean lower idle power, simpler task scheduling, and less heat. Always measure your current draw during both sleep and active modes. If you're seeing milliamps in deep sleep, well, then something's seriously wrong. Get this right and the ESP32 can get by with a trickle of power. Get it wrong and your customers will be forced to recharge much more often than necessary. Mistake number three is using bare chips instead of a pre-certified module. The bare ESP32 chip looks cheaper than a pre-certified module. And you might be thinking, I'm already custom designing the PCB, so why not just use the bare chip so I can maximize my profit. 
But if you go that route, you're now responsible for the full RF layout, impedance matching, antenna tuning, and regulatory compliance that includes certifications like FCC and CE. That's no small task. You'll need RF expertise, controlled impedance traces, specialized test equipment, and possibly multiple layout iterations. If your board fails certification, you could face delays, redesigns, and unexpected costs. I once worked with a startup that tried to save a couple bucks per unit by using a bare chip. They were so confident that they were going to sell millions of their product that they wanted to maximize their profit. So they spent weeks figuring out how to do the RF layout. Then they ended up failing certification and ended up switching back to a certified module, but not before they lost months of time and blew through much of their budget. Unless you're producing hundreds of thousands of units a year and have an RF expert on your team, it's usually better to use a pre-certified module. You'll still need to test emissions and overall performance, but the hardest part is already done for you. That reduces risk and speeds up your timeline. Mistake number four is bad antenna placement or bad antenna design. Even if you're using a certified ESP32 module with a built-in antenna, your PCB layout can still wreck your wireless performance. The antenna needs a clear keep out area, so that means no copper, no ground pour, and no nearby components. It should also be placed near the edge of the board, that's where it radiates the best. If you put the module too close to a battery, a shield, or even a plastic enclosure wall, it can detune the antenna. I once reviewed a board where the wireless module was placed right in the middle of the board and had tall metal capacitors near the antenna. The Wi-Fi range was so bad it couldn't hold a connection across a small room and it was a massive redesign to fix it. Espressif provides detailed placement guidelines in their data sheets, so be sure that you follow those closely. And always test the board inside the final enclosure because even plastic can affect the antenna performance. This is exactly why emissions testing and certifications are done on the complete assembled product, not just the PCB. Okay, this one's a real hot one. All right, sorry, bad joke. Mistake number five is ignoring heat dissipation. The ESP32 is small, but it can generate a lot of heat. If both cores are running, Wi-Fi is transmitting, and other peripherals are all active, temperatures can climb fast, especially in a sealed plastic enclosure. I've seen designs work okay in the lab, but out in the field, once they're exposed to sunlight and high ambient temperatures, well, then they start hitting thermal limits, glitching, and sometimes even shut down. To prevent these types of problems, be sure to place a copper port under the module with thermal vias to help carry the heat away into ground and increase the board thickness, use a heat sink, or add venting to your enclosure to improve airflow. If your product will run hot or be used outdoors, run thermal simulations or do real stress testing early. The ESP32 can handle heat, but only if your board design and enclosure help it out. Mistake number six is poor power supply design. The ESP32 draws high peak current during Wi-Fi or Bluetooth transmissions. We're talking about hundreds of milliamps for short bursts. If your regulator or power supply can't keep up, then you'll end up getting weird behavior like resets, brownouts, or dropped connections. Everything might look fine on the bench when traffic is low, but as soon as you ramp up data transfer or awake from sleep, those power dips can cause major problems. Make sure your power regulator can handle the current with fast transient response. Just because a regulator can supply the necessary current doesn't mean that it can always do it fast enough. And be sure to place bulk capacitors close to the ESP32 to help smooth out any current spikes. Mistake number seven is designing without over the air or OTA update capability. One of the best features of the ESP32 is its built-in support for over-the-air firmware updates. But a lot of products end up shipping without using it. That might be fine if your firmware is flawless, but most of the time you'll want to be able to fix or improve something after launch. Without OTA, you're stuck with manual reflashing or costly returns. 
You should add OTA capability early. Set up your flash partitions properly, test the update process with real builds, and make sure your firmware can recover gracefully if something goes wrong. A solid OTA update process can save your product since it allows the firmware to constantly evolve. Mistake number eight is not testing in real conditions early enough. It's one thing to get your ESP32 board working on the bench. It's another thing to see how it behaves in the real world. A product that seems stable in a controlled lab may just fall apart when customers start using it every day. That's why you need to test early with your actual firmware inside the final enclosure and under conditions that mimic the real world application. Run it in hot and cold environments with batteries that are half drained and next to other Wi-Fi devices to check for interference. Let it run for days, not just minutes. These kinds of tests expose problems you'll never catch in just a quick bring up. Maybe a current spike resets the board, maybe heat buildup cuts your wireless range. If you don't catch these problems before launch, your customers will, and that's far more expensive to fix later than it is to test thoroughly now. Don't forget to grab your free design mistakes checklist bundle. Whether you're designing the product yourself or outsourcing the design, these checklists will help you prevent mistakes and costly redesigns. The link is in the description below or you can scan this QR code right here. Mistake number nine, wrong GPIO usage. The ESP32's GPIO matrix lets you remap many signals, but not everything can be routed just anywhere. For example, ADC inputs have to go to specific pins, same with touch input, flash access, and strapping configuration. If you assign one of these special pins to a general task like toggling an LED, you might break the boot process or corrupt flash reads. The best approach is to start by identifying any fixed function interfaces you need, like I2C, SPI, UART, ADC, capacitive touch. Lock those down first, then use the remaining GPIOs for lower priority tasks. For some interfaces, you'll want to minimize routing distance, so also consider that when selecting pins depending on the package. If you want to avoid most of these costly mistakes, then definitely check out my Hardware Academy. And if you found this video helpful, then you're definitely going to want to watch my video on PCB design mistakes that can destroy production. It will save you from even more costly mistakes.